from the far reaches of the Milky Way galaxy, it's Retro Nerd Girl with a film review for you. Today I'll be reviewing the movie Battle Beyond the Stars, released in 1980, starring George Papard, Robert Vaughn, and Richard Thomas. The synopsis is: A young farmer from the planet Akir recruits mercenaries to defend his planet under invasion. The story. This movie came about at the aspirations of American film director, producer, personality, and sometimes actor Roger Corman. He was a legendary filmmaker, pioneering independent films of nearly every genre, and produced over 500 of them. He gave many upcoming directors their early gigs, such as Joe Dante, Francis Ford Coppola, Ron Howard, and Martin Scorsese. He also featured upcoming actors like Dennis Hopper, Sylvester Stallone, William Shatner, Peter Fonda, Bruce Dern, and Jack Nicholson. He is one of the movie icons that probably influenced every filmmaker that you've ever loved. Corman, after seeing the success of Star Wars in 1977, wanted to make a space opera. Star Wars was inspired by *The Hidden Fortress* in 1958, a Japanese adventure film directed by Akira Kurosawa. Corman wanted to make it a little bit different, so he drew heavy inspiration from another Akira Kurosawa film, *Seven Samurai*, released in 1954, and the Hollywood remake of that film, *The Magnificent Seven*, released in 1960. Another film that was inspired by Seven Samurai was a really cool B movie that I love, which is Message from Space, released in 1978. Oh, I just love that movie. As well, the movie is also the inspiration for Zack Snyder's answer to Star Wars: Rebel Moon. Battle Beyond the Stars was given a story credit by Ann Dyer, and the screenplay was written by John Sayles under the working title Battle Amongst the Stars. Initially, Australian director Richard Franklin was going to direct. However, Jimmy T. Murakami ended up directing it. It's a low-budget movie with all of the classic issues many low-budget films have, but the excitement of the intention shines through the adventure, and I simply adore it. The pacing at an hour and forty-four minutes, it isn't my favorite aspect of the film. The film has the problem of figuring out how to blend exposition, drama, humor, and action. A lot of that rests on the shoulders of the script. And I think that a more aggressive approach to the editing could have helped the pacing, acting, and the audience response to the film. However, there's still so much to love about this unique classic B science fiction movie. The challenge. The challenge in the story is the Malmori Empire's evil tyrant Sador. He rules by fear and intimidation, taking what he wants from weaker planets by brutal force. Sador is incredibly charismatic on screen, chewing up every scene that he's in. But there isn't much of a backstory to the character except for the detail of his body deteriorating to the point that he needs transplants that he takes from his victims. It's usually some poor officer that has made a mishap along the way. It can account for him being angry constantly, or most likely his anger is the cause of his physical issues manifesting itself there. Who knows? I'd like to think that. But much like Star Wars's evil empire, Sador has within his power a very deadly planet-destroying weapon called the Stellar Converter. It turns planets into small stars, thus killing all life on said planet. It finds the peaceful planet of Akir with no warriors, no weapons of any kind. This planet should have been very easy for him to acquire. He demands that they submit to him in seven risings. His downfall is most likely giving them time to comply and also leaving the site. This is also a feature in Seven Samurai. Granted, he had business to handle, conquering many worlds. He assumed that the people of Akir were too docile to attempt to fight back. He's not my favorite villain, but he sure is entertaining to watch. Now, my empathy. The empathy here is a little weak for me in the beginning of the story, but it grows as it continues over time, meeting all of the protagonists, and there are a lot of them. 
the protagonists are only as good as their purpose. So the main purpose for all of them coming together is really to save the planet Akir from Sadar. So I hope you'll indulge me as I lay out the story play by play to dive a little bit deeper into these characters and how they matter to the story. The only warrior left on the farming world of Akir is Zed, the last of the famous Akira Kosiers, but he's also blind. However, he suggests that they find warriors, mercenaries, and outlaws, anyone who can help them from other worlds, to fight against Sador and the Malmori Empire. A young man by the name of Shad, who has experience piloting Zed's ship, volunteers to find help. This all must be done before Sator's due date of Seven Risings. Many people have compared Shad to Luke Skywalker, and there are definite similarities like the two being young boys for an adventure. For me, that is about the end of it. I think the two characters are very different from each other because Luke is forced to take on the adventure, having no other place to go. Shad actually volunteers for the adventure. He's also proud and courageous from the start. He doesn't quite know what he's doing all of the time, but he's got the gumption to try. On Zed's ship that Shad has to pilot, there's a sentient computer by the name of Nell. Nell has a snarky but helpful personality with a hint of animosity that Zed is not piloting her with whom she misses and is probably in love with. Over time, she does develop some feelings for Shad as she is trying to show him the ropes of warfare and space battles. It's a very loving, motherly figure that she plays. Among the things that is a challenge for Shad is the code of Akira called the Varda. Shad follows the Varda, which teaches non-violence. But unfortunately, in this situation, he has to throw away those teachings and adopt a new way to survive this. The first warrior Shad finds is Nanelia, who is the young daughter of Dr. Hephaestus, a friend of Zed who may have weapons that can aid them in a fight. Unfortunately, Dr. Hephaestus has lost his mind since Zed knew him and has planned to keep Shad in his facility to reproduce with his daughter. Ew. <laughs> And naturally, Nanelia leaves with very little convincing. I call her the first warrior because she not only goes off on her own mini-adventure recruiting more warriors, but also has a computer that can predict Sato's battle strategy. I only wish that she could have used her skills to build them a robot army, since that is one of her skill sets, and I would have pretty much passed out from sheer happiness if that happened. <laughs> Now, there are some awkward romantic interludes between Shad and Anelia surrounding the mating practices that their cultures keep. And I couldn't help but laugh at some of it because it was meant to add some levity during the film. Shad finds a ship being attacked by space jackers. Because of the Varda's clause that says Akira can take a life to save a life, Shad destroys his first ship. And I thought it was important that the film takes a few beats for him to wrestle with this. And it really does. I, I do love that moment. We watch him transform from a simple farmer into a soldier. And it brings the audience just a little bit closer to the character. The ship he saves belongs to the Space Cowboy, a freighter pilot from Earth who is delivering a shipment of laser handguns to the planet Umatil. They both witness the destruction of Umatil and the Cowboy offers to give Akira the weapons and train them on how to use it. The Space Cowboy anchors the film with the reality that Earth is somehow in the picture and perhaps this story is being told sometime into the far future. He has no name but goes by Space Cowboy. Of all of the warriors, he is the one that we feel the most sad for because he's immediately likable and he really didn't expect to be in a war. He was only there to help and leave, but unfortunately, he gets wrapped up into all of this mess because he delivers those weapons to the Akir after Shad saves his life. One cool feature of the character is that he has a utility belt that is basically a full bar so he can make cocktails whenever he likes and he makes a lot of them. <laughs> I would say the whole movie he's pretty much having his own little party. 
Next, we meet Nestor, which are five clones within a hive mind of millions across the universe. Wow, this is so cool. <laughs> they have three eyes and play everything with a serious tone, but somehow they are charming and humorous. There are several moments in the story that are notoriously hilarious just because of these characters. They simply want to join the fight for the adventure to relay back to the others of their kind. It's very interesting to think of all of the many experiences they may be sharing among the entire Nestor at the same time. It's a wonderful idea. And I wish the story went deeper into that. And I've always imagined it to be like using the mind to connect to the internet. It's a very interesting concept. Meanwhile, Nanelia picks up Cayman, the last of the lazuli from the Lambda Zone. Initially, he was written to be a dark, brooding humanoid, not quite as he appears on screen. He has a vendetta against Sadar, who has destroyed his people. Cayman also has with him the Calvins, Urim and Thurum, who communicate in degrees of heat. Next, Shad goes to the planet Costo looking for mercenaries only to find that they have all left except for one, Gelt. He has a bounty on his head that prevents him from ever leaving the planet and enjoying the treasure that he has amassed that surrounds him. It's really sad as he sits on a throne but is forced to hunt and eat serpents to survive. Now all he wants is a good meal and a place to live peacefully. Shad offers this in exchange for his help in the battle, and he accepts. Shad meets Sant Exman of the Valkyrie, who has been following him. Valkyrie is a goddess in Norse mythology, who chooses those who may die in battle and those who may live. In this story, the Valkyrie are a warrior race that take great honor in dying in battle. Enthusiastically, she sees this as her opportunity to do so. Shad is very dismissive of her because her ship is very small, but it turns out to be her advantage in battle as she is the one to destroy the world-ending star converter. Sent X-Men is really interesting because she is so bubbly and playful, you just can't help but like her. Her motto is, live fast, fight well, and have a beautiful ending. And so she does in this story. Seeing all of the characters band together to help Akira is so endearing to know that most of them will give their lives for Akira and hardly know anything about the place. Yep, the stakes are really high and most of the characters don't make it and it hurts when they die. And that's the proof that they were well written and performed technical aspects. The film was Roger Corman's most expensive at the time at his production company New World Pictures, costing two million dollars. In perspective, Star Wars in 1977 was 11 million. I think that the thing I hear a lot is that if you don't have the money to compete with the best, to give everyone the best special effects possible, then why make your movie? And for some, it is definitely for the love of making movies. And also for some small independent studios, hey, why not make a profit too? I say why not? I mean, it's entertained me for years to see many of these attempts and just to see how many inventive ideas they come up with. And this is truly a wonderful, wonderful exploration for many of these artists and people who were in training to become the best in the industry. And it turns out that many of these films end up being entertaining as well. No special effects company would contract the film for less than the cost of the entire budget because all of the things that they needed to have inside of the film for special effects. So Corman decided to create his own in-house special effects department within his studio. One of the most important contributions to this film, special effects, was James Cameron. Also inspired by Star Wars, James quit his job as a truck driver to become a filmmaker in 1977. Then, in 1978, he directed, wrote, and produced a short film, Xenogenesis, with a friend which caught the attention of special effects supervisor Chuck Komsky and impressed Corman and, and Gail Ann Hurd, who was working at Corman's company. 
The two met on this film, which eventually began a professional partnership and a four-year marriage from 1985 to 1989. Chuck was the one who brought James in as a model maker. His most notorious creation in the film was the exterior design of the hero ship in the film, Nell. It was a bit literal to make her feminine, but what usually startles most people when they first see her is how she resembles both the interior and exterior female productive parts. It's both amusing and brilliant. Cameron was asked to handle miniature photography. He had no training in it, but had some idea how to do it, learning on the job. The original art director for the project had been suddenly fired because he was used to having a crew doing designs for him, which this set did not have the luxury of having, and they were getting behind on schedule. The job was then offered to Cameron, who went from earning $200 a week to $750 a week and pretty much learned everything on the job quickly. The production did not go without a hitch because James was actually fired and rehired twice during the production. It's not because of anything to do with James's work, because he was so dedicated to the project he would sleep on site overnight. Roger Corman had a habit of firing staff if he found unfinished projects with people still working on them. Perhaps he just got the impression that they weren't making any progress. But James figured out that when Corman saw sets in the same unfinished condition and they were devoid of anyone working on it, he would always be pleased. Cameron came up with the brilliant plan to avoid the firing and rehiring setbacks and had someone on the lookout for Corman's inspections so the set and crew would leave the studio. His plan worked and kept the production moving as smoothly as possible. The character designs in the film are particularly of interest to many science fiction lovers. The Nestor really stands out to me as one of the creatures that was not only fascinatingly written, but also visually both amusing and unique. These details really set the tone for the film. We smile when we see the Nestor. They're charming. They're clearly alien. But the makeup effect is very basic. The set for the village of Akir was a unique design that looked both unnatural and lacking in any visible efficiency. I was captivated by how it glowed and felt like Yes, this is how a low-tech, peaceful village would look like. <laughs> I want to live there. And it, it's truly beautiful. Behind the scenes, probably building one of these sets was a very young actor carpentering and painting between jobs on the recommendation of James Cameron. That was the legendary Bill Paxton who went on to work with James in The Terminator 1984 and Aliens 1986. On sound, each of the starships had unique synth effects created by Alan Horworth. He even used some recycled sounds from material he created from Star Trek The Motion Picture released in 1979. Alan also composed and recorded Gelt's jukebox music. Many of the sound and visual effects were reused in a science fiction low-budget film called Space Raiders, released in 1983. Oh, what a funny film that was. <laughs> you've got to see it. If you haven't seen it, you've got to check it out. Besides the unique story and visuals in this film, one of the most praised aspects of it is the triumphant score by the incomparable James Horner. This was his third theatrical film, and it led the way for his future work in a long list of sci-fi adventure blockbusters in the 1980s and 90s, eventually winning an Academy Award for Best Score for Titanic, released in 1996. Corman liked the score so much that he reused it in Space Raiders in 1983 as well as Wizards of the Lost Kingdom in 1985 and the unreleased film version of The Fantastic Four made in 1994 based on the Marvel comic. Now for the performances. Generally speaking, the actors here are all solid. As I mentioned before, the editing could have enhanced their performances even more. There was often a lot of dead space between performances, giving it a stage play effect at times. 
Richard Thomas portrayed Shad in the film with a petulant insolence that kept you liking him even though the character wasn't always right. At the time, Richard was a huge television star and a heartthrob being best known for his leading role as John Boy Walton in the CBS drama series The Waltons, which was on air from 1973 to 1981. Prior to that, he had been working in television since 1959 and received an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series. He's still working as of this review at 72 years of age, which is wonderful. He was really well known for more parts grounded in reality like dramas, period pieces, horrors, and thrillers. It was completely shocking to see him in an all-out science fiction space opera B movie. <laughs> for those who lived in this era, this is part of the charm of the film that makes it unique. On my first viewing of the film one late night, I remember staring at it in complete wonder at seeing Richard Thomas in this movie. And I sat flabbergasted that I hadn't heard of this film prior to that moment. I searched frantically for the TV guy to tell me the name of this glorious find, and it was wonderful. Darlene Flugel played the part of Nanelia. She was a fashion model who studied acting under Stella Adder. Her first acting role was in one of my favorite thrillers, Eyes of Laura Mars, released in 1978. Wow, what a film. She was essentially playing a model in that film. Not much of a stretch for her to do that. However, in this film, unfortunately, she isn't given a whole lot to do, and she makes the most of her moments to shine. She went on to have a great film and television career and later became a film producer and professor teaching acting and drama at the University of Central Florida's School of Film and Digital Media program. Sybil Danning was already a sex symbol of German cinema by the time her first American role materialized as the Valkyrie warrior Sant X-Men. What I adore about her performance is her sheer excitement and the way she becomes the focus of every scene that she's in. This was the beginning of her career in American B-movies, which she became, quote-unquote, the queen of action pictures. One other feature of her performance were her incredible costumes that were just barely hiding private areas. Truth be told, they had a habit of slipping and had to be covered with things like band-aids. None of that seemed to bother her performance. We are none the wiser. She was a real trooper. And to this day, she speaks so fondly of her experience on set. Most of the budget was spent on the salaries for Robert Vaughn and George Prepard, and I think that was one of the smartest decisions that was made. They both had not only memorable parts, but grounded their characters in a bit of familiarity to pop culture. George Prepard played the space cowboy who is exceptionally adored by most viewers. There was also a space cowboy in Galaxina, which was released in the same year, 1980, starring Dorothy Stratton. So maybe there was this idea going around that we all wanted a space cowboy. Hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't mind seeing a movie just about a space cowboy doing his thing and the outlaws of space. <laughs> Now, from George's performance, one gets the feeling as if he was simply playing a happier version of himself that embraced the dark reality of his fate from the minute he appears on screen to his last scene. It's a tragic part, but he plays it perfectly, desperate for any opportunity to do one or two last things that make him feel alive, because life is short. Brilliant! <laughs> it's subtle, but it's plain as day. Robert Vaughn plays a similarly tragic hero in the character of Geld, but does so differently. Many reviewers have said that Robert is simply returning to his old part that he played in the adaption of Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, the American frontier film The Magnificent Seven. 20 years prior in 1960. There he played a gun for hire by the name of Lee. There were so many lines of dialogue that were repeated in this movie. But there's a subtle difference in the two characters that I think is important. In Magnificent Seven, Lee sacrifices himself as a means of personal honor. In this movie, 
guilt puts his life on the line because he has no pleasure in it as he is and he has nowhere to go except for the promise of living on a doomed planet robert expertly plays into that very well there's a desperate loneliness in his eyes and a precise message in every spoken word if there are tears to be shed during the movie it would be during the last moments of gelt's life john saxon plays the part of sadar and boy is he my favorite part of this movie he said that he took the role of sadar because he liked the script script and thought it was funny and amusing and it is he didn't go full ham with it completely wild and unhinged but i think he approached it with a calm illogical logic that made the character unpredictable i do love him in this the leader of the nestor really captures many viewers in the story for his sheer charm he delivers so much comedy without overplaying the fact that they are aliens he's played by earl bowen who would later go on to star as dr peter silberman in the terminator film series he does a great job in this Earlier in her career before becoming known as a comedian, Kathy Griffin was an extra in this film. I also wanted to call to attention that Whitney Rydbeck, who played the robot Saunders, was on screen for a very short time but was remarkable. In fact, in my opinion, all of the robots on Dr. Hephaestus' station was amazing. Those guys need a big round of applause for their performances the enjoyment to finish up the story the last third of it is an all-out battle against sador it's brutal everyone dies except for shad and anelia there are very few survivors left nell gets damaged so badly that she thinks that shad is zed and it breaks your heart because she has been such a big part of the story her agency is really what gives a lot of charm to the story so when she loses it it breaks your heart just a little Shad activates Nell's self-destruct program and then leaves in an escape pod just as it destroys Sater's ship. Shad and Anelia are on their way to return to Akir and Shad says nobody is truly dead when they have been loved and are celebrated by the living. The Akira will always remember the sacrifices made by the mercenaries who will forever be honored in the legends of Akir. And that's basically the end of the story. Now, in my opinion, the ending was the second biggest flaw besides the editing. It was so abrupt and cold, it would have been really, really amazing if we got a celebratory moment on the planet or even seeing the planet years later with memorial statues of the warriors. And I'm not sure exactly how much more we should have had, but just something gently to ease us out of the story, maybe to show us exactly what we were fighting for. It would have just been wonderful to see something like that at the end, to just raise the spirits and leave us on a high note. Unfortunately, battle beyond the stars may be tragically dismissed as a low budget ripoff of star wars from 1977 as if star wars wasn't amazing i think we have to remember that star wars was in a league of its own and it was a huge phenomenon so anything else was not going to be as great but it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy it i mean what other roger corman film do you have james cameron becoming james cameron behind the scenes <laughs> low budget movies like these were the practice grounds for the greats and many of the movies you love stand on its shoulders it manages to have adorable charm and surprisingly a solid story with the classic good versus evil theme and in a perfect storm of bravery honor and adventure even with its tragic end for most of the characters much of the credit goes to akira kurosawa for inspiring so many filmmakers with his movies seven samurai inspired battle beyond the stars the magnificent seven message from space and the latest film rebel moon these are the tales that spark the imagination from campfires to the movie theaters they affect the receiver as they too dream of being a hero that they matter and that they could make a difference it's for that reason this film has a very special place in my heart 
My rating is a 7.8. That sums up my review. I hope you liked it and if you did, I've got hundreds of videos so go on and browse the channel. Subscribe if you haven't done so already and hit the bell icon to be the very first to be notified of my next video or live stream. This is Retro Nerd Girl signing off. Take care movie lovers, I'm off to my next review!